Hello and welcome to another very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. We are joined by Andrew Spinmore of Confluent. Now, this is going to be an interesting discussion, primarily because Andrew's come into Sales Ops from a background that I don't think we've had anyone else come from. And then you've been practicing the the, the, well, the, the skill for a number of years for a number of different companies, including Pusher and now Confluent. So Docker. Docker. <laughs> is Pusher another like I software know. company? I, don't know. I think it is. And that's why I got, got confused. They've always got funky, funky names. Yeah. Okay. So Docker and Confluent. Um, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to kick off by understanding your transition from accounting into the sales ops, like how that happened, no. why that happened. Okay. Um, yeah, it wasn't intentional, uh, which I don't think ever is in, mm. the, in the sales ops space. Um, I started off in an uh, accounting finance type background um, in the private sector originally. Um, I mean, this is going back years to my late teens, early 20s. Uh, that was also unintentional as well. Mm. It wasn't something that I wanted to actually get involved in, but I sort of found that I quite enjoyed it and yeah. the, the office vibe and culture. Um, so I did that for a number of years, a couple of different companies, um, and then I actually went to a uh, insurance software firm over in the city called RMS, or Risk Management Solutions, um, and I was in an accounting finance role there for about three and a half years, I think it worked out. At. Um, started to get bored, basically, that's the bottom line. I was a bit, getting a bit disillusioned by it, the whole thing and mm -hmm. couldn't really see myself sort of being long-term. I didn't really want to go back and study like accounting exams, um, do all of that schooling again. Um, and at the time, I was quite buddy-buddy uh, with the, the sales ops guy. Um, it was just one guy in, in the mirror. Um, and how, long did you, how many years ago was this? Um, this was, so I started in RMS back in 2011. Cool. So, so this is probably about 2013, I'd say. 2012, maybe. Yeah. Um, that sort of period. Um, and I was buddy, I, I was like friendly with this guy. Um, we got on really, really well. He done sales ops, I was in accounting. We sort of spoke a little bit work-wise, but it was more sort of a social type relationship. Um, he actually wanted to break out of sales ops to become an account exec. Um, but I don't know why at the time it never really sort of lagged to me to think actually this would be a good move for me so I was sort of like prepping myself that I was going to resign and move on and do something else maybe like move into more of a finance versus accounting type space um, and the leadership team actually called wind of it and because I got on well with everyone there they liked me I liked them um, they didn't really want to see me move on from the company so they said like why don't you move into this guy's space, uh, this guy's position, um, it'd, be, it'd be a good transition because obviously you've got that like accounting finance experience, dealing like speaking with the US all the time, um, where we was headquartered. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, actually, this is this is pretty good. So like, because I was friendly with the guy, he was chatting to me, he was telling me about it, and I was thinking, Just, like, I don't really sort of like this is all brand new to me. Like, what does it entail? Like, what what do I do? Um, and then it sort of just snowballed from there, really. Um, and it was a very, very quick process, I guess, because it was like an internal transfer. And I think within a couple of weeks, like he had moved out into the field um, to start selling, and I had moved into his position. So flew out to California, where we was headquartered, spent a week there. Flew to the New, New York office, spent a week with the senior sales ops person there, and then basically thrown back in London yeah. and was like, go for it, type of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's where the sort of the journey started, really. Um, and it, it turned out it was probably the best decision that I actually made. So. Cool. And so you went from there into was that when you moved to Docker? No. So I stayed um, at RMS in in a sales ops role for I think it was about twenty months, maybe. Um, and then I actually. Um, I can't remember like what the reasoning behind. I mean, this is obviously back in 2014 or whatever it was. Um, but I thought I want to see what's out there in the market. Like, I want to see. I think there were some leadership changes and stuff, and like I didn't like the direction the company was going in or the way it was planned out. Um, and I couldn't see any growth like in terms of the role. Um, so I actually was like, okay, like I've got this now. Like I've got a really good grasp of sales ops, and I really enjoy it. And it's sort of like a green field I can get out there and really sort of do some good stuff, um, plenty of ideas. And then so I went to Cloudera, um, 
which are, they merged with Hortonworks um, last year, and they're in the big data space. Um, and then, yeah, and then I went to Cardera, um, stayed at Cardera for about 23 months or something, um, then moved from Cardera to Docker, um, and then Docker, and now I'm at Confluent, which I started yeah. in January this year. Awesome. So we zoom in on Confluent now. Yeah. What is the size of your team? If they're in the team, and then what, are, what what number of salespeople are you currently supporting? Yeah, so I am the I was the first and currently the only sales ops person in EMEA. Um, I'm currently doing two two jobs at the moment. So I'm doing the sales ops business partner inside. Yep. We have the VP of sales um, for EMEA and the other regional leaders um, in uh, South EMEA, Central EMEA, um, and the UK um, and Ben Ups Nordic. Um, and on the other side, I'm doing the deal desk side as well, uh, just purely because um, they were like, we need someone to do this while we hire someone because obviously we're, the company's like just exploded and um, we need boots on the ground there, like same time zone, mm -hmm. you, you, like you're European, you can get on better with these guys than we can get on, like, you know, yeah. that type of thing. So I was like, okay, that's fine. Like I did a little bit of deal desk stuff before at Docker. Not really my back, like I'm better on the business partner inside. Yeah. But it's fine. Like I was like, okay, I, I, I know what I'm doing, like I can deal with it and um, and whatever. So I'm sort of doing both those roles at the moment. Um when I started it was, it's interesting actually because <laughs> when I started in January, we there was myself, um, my boss who's based out in San Francisco or Palo Alto, um, and there was uh, there's another guy, like a, a senior deal desk guy. Um, and it was just us, and we was just like, and it was just him before me doing all the deal desk stuff globally. Mm -hmm. He was like, we need someone in, like desperately, like we have to, you know, like the comfort, the, the business is scaling stuff like that at a rapid pace to keep up with this. Like we need someone in. I think it was like it was pretty much killing him. That's when I came in, and then within three weeks of me starting, we hired an, another deal desk analyst in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And then probably six, seven weeks after that, we hired two sales ops business partners in the US, one that covers the East Coast, one that covers the West Coast. Yeah. Um, so the plan for me really is to, to move away from the whole deal desk space um, in EMEA. Uh, we're actually recruiting for someone at the moment. And then I can purely focus on business partnering and planning um, and spending time with the, the regional leaders. Got it. So um, effectively, how many, on the business partner side, how many salespeople are you currently supporting? Yeah, so I look after me. So at the moment, I think we've got, um, my last count, we had about 38 reps um, that I'm looking after that I'm supporting on a daily basis, all, active, all actively selling um, right from... Um, uh, enterprise account reps to named account managers um, to the commercial team yeah. and then obviously everything else that goes on with sales ops or everything else that feeds into the sales ops world um, with the SDR team and marketing and rec, rec and um, sort of being that bridge between Sorry. all the different business units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the thing that stands between all of these different stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a sales ops for me is like, we really are like the central nervous system, I guess, mm -hmm. with all the business units, like to keep the business ticking over. Um, I mean, every day I'm dealing with the, sales, with the sales team and that could be problems in our CRM system, that could be paperwork issues, it could be them asking questions about... Does this bit of, does this document constitute a booking? Um, can you get on the phone with finance tonight and speak to them about this? And then the SDR team would be like, this lead is rooted incorrectly and I can't transfer accounts and it's sort of all of that as well. And then there's a lot of obviously the other stuff like the planning with the leaders and um, account management, medic, yeah, all everything legal. Um, the customer success team, you yeah. know, like the sales engineers, like it's sort of everything sort of feeds into the sales of the world um, to sort of, you know, flip it upside down, spin it around, push it out the other side nice and clean um, <laughs> so we can get the business over the line. Yeah. Um, on the tech side right now at Confluent, what is the, like from a high level, what's the kind of sales tech stack? Um, so uh, we use S SFDC for our CRM. Um, it's our Bible, as such you know, like we want everything in there. It's, uh, I think you have to have like one place that you can direct everyone. <laughs> one of the bugbears of mine, I've seen at previous companies, and it's probably the same across a lot of companies, is that you have too much 
collateral or like sales guidance documents, um, uh, the different pieces of the business that ultimately all need to come together that are all like scattered around. So we try and sort of like try and keep everything within Salesforce. Um, we also use uh, Clary, which is plugged into Salesforce, which is our forecasting and analytic tool. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's great to have used it in both my previous companies, so Cloudera and Docker. Um, I mean, on the other side, we, uh, we use uh, LinkedIn Nav. Uh, the, the SDR team do uh, use that for prospecting. Um, we had a we had a system um, a piece of software plugged into Salesforce called Player Maps, which the guys can actually plan out the hierarchy of accounts yeah. to work out the route of the right people they need to talk to. Um, and then we use like Slack as well versus like any other type of instant messenger, just to like quick back and forth to get things to get things sorted out. You mentioned uh, FSDC as your your bible. How do you keep it the bible? How do you keep the data in there as accurate as possible? Yeah. So it's interesting because coming to Confluent um, and knowing the, the hearing the great things about the company um, and, and where they're get, where they're getting to. Um, you sort of come in with a certain type of expectation, so you automatically, I don't know why I do this, because I do it at every single company I've been at, but it's like, it never works out like that. But you go in and you think the system is going to be watertight, everything locked down, automation spitting out from everywhere, like the, everything's seamless, and then you come in and you're like, you start discovering, and you're just like, oh, that's crazy. Like, why is that like that? Like, at my last company, that was totally different like we, we didn't allow reps to do this or we didn't allow like the reps wouldn't have had to go through this amount of these many steps to actually get stuff done so in the past seven eight months that i've been we're actually and now the team's growing we're actually really um stripping back some of the layers of the system um putting things in place some of it we're finding out through error some of it we're finding out where things have gone wrong with the reps um which is is quite good because obviously it hype flags it and then you can jump on it immediately if it's going to be like business critical um, and then a lot of the other things we're putting in place, it's the, not so much the needs, it's the wants, like what do we want to get out of the system, how do we want it to flow, what will make it seamless for the reps, but also for the other business users um, that log in on a daily basis. Um, so in terms of like data integrity and, and, and cleanliness and hygiene, um, I mean, I, I guess that every user that goes into the system and can actively do things, I, I would say that it's on everyone in the, to, 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 to take the time and, and give the special attention to make sure that um, what they're putting in is correct and to keep it as tidy as possible. It's never the case because it all depends on the skill set of the person within Salesforce. It depends on like the time someone's got in the day. Um, so we are starting to put different reports and um, alerts in place and um, hygiene dashboards that really the ops team own um, yeah. where we're sort of keeping track on things every, I think I've got like a dashboard at the moment I check like every, three times a week maybe yeah. um, to make sure things are sort of like tight and, and nice and clean. Um, and then we've actually just hired someone in the US to run um, the CRM team, like to build a small CRM team. Um, and it's going to, and they've already made like a big impact with the team in terms of really straightening out some of the stuff and segmentation and making sure the user profiles are set up correctly. So, um, yeah, so it's like full steam ahead with us at the moment internally to, to really get the ship shape yeah. system. Nice. Um, focusing on the, you said 38 sales reps. Right? Yeah. Um, focusing on these guys. How are you, what are you currently doing to try and make them as productive as possible? Um, I think, um, and I was saying to you, I was saying this to you before we before we went on air that um, a lot of the guys that come into the software space they've already got a very good understanding, um, whether they've heard about the product or not, um, and if it's built on the similar foundations of other pieces of, soft, of, of products or software they've sold previously, so they sort of tend to pick up things pretty quickly. Um, and I guess looking through the eyes of the sales rep, they they like getting paid. They they like earning money, and the way they earn money is to bring bookings in. Um, so they will ramp themselves as quick as possible, um, which is great for the organisation because it's one of the key metrics that you want to drive down. Um, you don't want a long ramp time. Um, so I think that they've always got that in their in their call. Um, from the ops side, um, I always like to look at it that 
one of the main things, well, one of the main sort of mantras that I go by is that the whole point of sales ops is to basically assist the sales reps to sell bigger, smarter, quicker. Um, so I try and sort of put, remember that on a daily basis to think, if I was in the field, how would I want to use the system? Do I want to go through 15 steps to get a quote out the door? No, not really. Um, how do we cut that back? Like, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the hard stops? Um, and I think the great thing about Compliment is it's such an open company where um, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to up the chain. I can sit there and actually call something out and say, that's complete mm-hmm. rubbish, basically. Like, there's no need for the, the, that to be there. And a lot of the time it's historical um, where something might have been put in place and then someone's moved on, but you just end up keeping the same flow in the system because you think it makes sense. It's too much of a nightmare to change. Um, so I like to try and look um, from the, in the CRM point of view it, to, to make it, when they actually log in, that they don't automatically mentally shut down. They want to get into the system. They want to get done what they need to get done. And then they can get something out within like 10, 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking like building reports because obviously a lot of the guys, well, they're always going to come to sales ops and say, trying to build this report, what do I put in? Like, yeah. am I in the wrong report? Like, this is not showing me the right data, blah, blah, blah. Um, but for me, it's, we need the sales guys to, to, to go sell. And we need them to bring in bookings, which means we need a full set of paperwork. So for them to do that, they need to go back to the start and get that pricing into the system and then forecast it correctly and mm-hmm. make sure everything's uploaded. So if we can make that as seamless as possible, to shorten the time that it takes for them to get something in front of the customer, mm-hmm. um, then that's a that's a big win yeah. in, in my book. So bigger, better, faster, is that what you said? That's the point of sales ops. Bigger, smarter, smarter. faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so, why I like to look at it. So if you could summarize your job in like 10 words, it would be to enable sales to sell bigger, better, and faster. Yeah, 100%. Got it. Yeah. Um, can we talk about your role in the forecasting process? Yeah. Now, are you, do you give the data to the sales managers and they work through the forecast with their reps or are you responsible for producing the forecast? Um, yeah, so I don't actually produce the forecast. Um, I do sort of tend to cut the data a couple of different ways on a weekly basis mm-hmm. um, and we'll present stuff to our VP of sales. I mean, he's a very intelligent guy. Like He's been doing this for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, he knows what works. Uh, as a company at the moment, we're using a, um, a category type model forecast. Um, and then we also allow our sales leadership team um, to actually plug in per deal what their gut feel is in terms of like adding a percentage to that. And then we can look at the weighting of it and mm-hmm. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a fantastic data science team based out in California that have managed to do all this crazy stuff behind the scenes that it's quite interesting. I'd love to, if I had, to, if I had the time, I'd love to sort of dig into it with them in more detail mm-hmm. to actually see how they come out, how they come up with these types of models because the correlation between what they ask the sales leadership team to do and then the result after the end of the quarter is very, very close. Very. So it's quite, yeah, yeah, it's something that I really want to sort of maybe spend some time with them at some point when I've got the time. Um, but again, back to your question. So our leader, our sales, um, our VP of sales, he he knows going into the quarter. He probably looks at quarter plus one, so he already knows. He's already fully aware of Q4 um, at the end of the year. What is risky? What is likely to happen? Just from how plugged in how plugged in he is with the sales leadership team um so he's already made his call and judgment on what he thinks we're going to do against our number um and then from my side on the business partner side i will literally make sure every single deal is scrubbed from a forecasting perspective to make sure that the numbers that we are talking about on the forecast the weekly forecast call with our leadership team in the us um we can sort of stand behind and walk back into and, and feel sort of quite confident about that um, so that's where sort of my that's where I sort of you know move move Got on it. to. So so you take the forecast and make sure that when you go into that meeting on Monday that everything is like one hundred percent correct. Yes. Cool. If, yeah. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving on to metrics, and I'm going to change the question a little bit. From your experience in sales operations, which metric has given you the most insight into a rep's performance? Um, I would say the. Um, the new and expansion metric. Um, so bringing in new business and expand mm-hmm. uh, and the expansion of the existing business, uh, the, whether it, whether that be at the renewal t- 
time or whether it's like midterm mm. um, through the renewal. I think that says I think that can speak volumes because the, on the new side, you're going to actually see if the rep is good enough to get into a, a, a blank patch and do what they said they were good at doing during the interview process yeah. um, and, and what they they claim to be able to do in, in bringing in new logos. Um, and then on the expansion side, it shows um, their productivity on a relationship level um, because obviously once you sell, you don't – once you sell to a customer, you don't necessarily – I wouldn't consider myself a sales rep anymore. I'd consider myself part relate, part account manager mm-hmm. because obviously that renewal is then for some companies your responsibility to take care of. Um, and I've seen it. I've seen it a couple of different ways in, in previous companies where the renewal will get handed off, um, and that's fine. Like sometimes that that works for some companies. Um, and then I've seen it the the other side where the rep will then become that relationship manager and still have to go and bring in new business. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think if you can look at that metric, you're sort of then able to step back into the productivity metric automatically. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it takes some digging into because obviously there's always going to be edge cases where things get handed off to people or they inherit something. Um, some reps can end up, you know, they can land lucky, they can walk into a company and be given like a, a done deal of like 500k and all they've got to do is like push, push a button mm-hmm. um, so I think the data doesn't always tell the complete story but then that's the great thing about sales ops because then you can dig into this the, the, the lower layers um, and then paint the picture for the right people basically and explain what's what, what's been going on got it um, and then throwing things like in on the reps again do you have a time from your experience where you've had to try and influence a rep to do something that maybe they didn't immediately see the value in doing? All the time. <laughs> and, and, and what's your strategy for doing that? Yeah, so, I mean, I always get frustrated. Like, every company I've been at, because I'm like, why do the reps behave like this? Or why do they put up such a fire? Um, because I'm viewing it from my side, and I'm thinking, this is going to make my life easier. So, of course, it's going to make the rep's life e- easier. But... When I take a step back, sometimes obviously I, I, I realise that they've seen this probably a hundred times more than I have and they've gone into companies and they've been using one system for six months and then suddenly it's like, oh no, we've got budget, we're going to get another system now and then they have to change and have to learn it and then, you know, like 12 months later, like you get new leadership come in and they'll bring in things mm-hmm. that they used to use and the reps sort of hate that. They they obviously like the, the consistency and the, the fact that they can just flip their laptop on in the morning and know exactly what they're doing. Not They're not waiting for something new to land in their inbox to say, mm-hmm. oh, by the way, now we're going to start doing this or now you're going to have to run your pricing proposals out of this system. Um, so I, there's, I've always had a lot of pushback and I think probably a lot of sales people, sales ops people will tell exactly the same story. I think that's just the way it goes. Um I mean, I like to think that I've got like really good soft skills with the reps because I I do sort of understand their, their struggles and their pains. I see it myself like daily, things that I get frustrated with, things that can't just you can't just flick a switch and, and get sorted overnight. Um so I try to sort of like empathize with them and you know, I thought I find the best way of getting them on board is actually walking them through something and make actually showing them in the in the most simple terms to say this is how I'm doing it but this is also how you're going to be doing it and actually highlighting how it can shorten the process or speed things up or the fact that it doesn't need to go through other levels of approval now. I mean a good example right is um, in CRM having a discount matrix built in. Um, It takes some work but if you've got something that you can actually build into the the CRM system uh, you know, where you've set different levels of discount approval, the reps, of course, they're going to love it if they submit a, an order and it comes under a certain value and it doesn't need to go all the way up to finance for approval. Yeah. It just bounces back and says, approved. They're going to pull it off, they're going to take it, yeah. and they're going to be like, wow, like, this is fantastic. So I think if you can really demonstrate those types of things, actually show them firsthand versus sending an email and saying, oh, by the way, um, which probably some reps don't even read anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I think that sort of, that can go a long way. Yeah. Um, and then final question is about the person who has inspired you the most yeah. in sales operations. Or inspired or taught you the most? Yeah, so I've got a mentor, the, or I use her as a mentor um, from my RMS days. Um, and she was she was hired after me. Um, she's based in New York. Her name's Debbie Stevens. 
Um, she came in to RMS as, I think she was our senior director of uh, Global Ops at the time. Um, and we just had like a very click click relationship type of thing. Like we just got on great socially and from like a business point of view, she got it and she was a very sort of no nonsense type person where she, she was very much like me. She doesn't like all this red tape and if something's ridiculous, then you need to call it out. There's no point of having it there. Which is which is very similar to, to my approach with um, with certain things. So I sort of we're still in touch now. Like she's in New York, I'm here. She comes over sometimes because she's she's at another company now. It's, um, I think she's like chief revenue officer or something, uh, some mm-hmm. similar position. But we're in touch and we we WhatsApp and I sort of lean on her a lot and I'll message her and she actually called me when I started a conference. I've been there like a couple of months and she was asking about Harry and she she knew I'd use it at a previous company. So she wanted to get all the the details on it and I like we were chatting and I was telling her what's good about it and what's not good about it. So she she's a really sort of great mentor to me. She's the sort of person that I can go to and she'll say, Andy, you've been stupid, like, you know, I wouldn't do that. Or I've seen from previous I mean she's been in this space for a long time. So she's what's her name? Debbie Stevens. Debbie Stevens. And where's she currently working? Um oh uh, Pymetrics. Yeah, it's like a, I think it's like a it's like a recruiting HR software type of um, thing. It takes the bias out of um, recruiting. recruiting, basically. Nice. Shout out to Debbie. Yeah, shout out to Debbie. Um, so let me share the, the things I liked. Um, you very very simplistically describe what I think is a really good definition of sales ops, mm. which is empowering sales people to sell bigger, smarter, faster. Yeah, I think that's like. A really, really good way of explaining self to someone. Yeah. Um, and then the second part I liked was about your interest in understanding a rep's ability to bring in new business versus mm. the renewal part. Yeah. And how these are kind of slightly different skill sets, but if you have to, if your business you have to do both of them, it's important to understand who's good at one. Yeah. Um, versus the other. So I thought that there's two points we haven't had before. Yeah. Okay. I think like the reps what I've seen over the past sort of seven years is that the reps I've seen a lot of reps will sell um, a 12 month term or a 24 month term if you're working on like a sub- annual subscription model um, and it's great for them they get paid and it's like almost like a set and forget it's like oh well, that's like 12 months out I don't need to worry about that now Yeah, but it's like an ongoing relationship because I think what a lot of people fail to understand is that the renewal is like the heir to your to the business lungs if it doesn't renew, mm. it, it's going to cause X amount of problems because obviously it doesn't look good in terms of customer churn. Mm. It doesn't speak well in the market. If someone's moved away to a competitor, mm. um, it doesn't really sort of show that you've got a good relationship team that keeps them with you, keeps them successful in what they're trying to achieve in their business. Mm. Um, because that's what we're doing. We're sending a solution to them because they have some type of pain point. Um, so the, I think the rep sort of needs to remember to keep that at the forefront of their mind, probably like three to six months, maybe even throughout the year, like mm-hmm. checking in with the customer to make sure that, you know, everything's going okay. Because if you can get that part now down, of course, why wouldn't the customer expand mm-hmm. with you and spend more money, right? It's like you don't want to get into discussions with them where they're threatening to leave because they've had a bad experience. Yeah. Um, and it's good for the rep because it means they get paid. It's good for the business. Like, and then you see the growth of the business. So... Yeah, but I, I don't think a lot of reps sort of under, uh, maybe they do. Maybe I'm, you know, like, I don't think they really sort of see it from that angle sometimes. You've you've always got like the I'm not going to say bad reps, but you've got the good reps that will think about stuff like that, and then you've got the reps that the they're quite happy to just sell and just move on type of thing. Yeah. Um, hand a renewal off to a renewal manager if they're getting paid at a lower base rate or something mm-hmm. or where. Well, they just maybe just don't like that relationship aspect. Like yeah. it might just be that their expertise is just to sort of bring in new logos and that's what they they love doing and that's fine. But I think there's a a lot of things in the transaction, even later down the line once it's been once the business is closed, that you sort of need to need to keep at the top of your top of your mind. And on that, Andrew, thank you so much for coming in. It's been immensely valuable. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's been fun. Hopefully we'll have you in again. Yeah, it'll be good.